Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Ted Parson. I'm a professor here at the UCLA School of Law where among my other jobs, I have the pleasure of directing the AI Pulse project, which examines the legal and policy implications of AI and related technologies. I am delighted to welcome you to today's web conversation sponsored by the AI Pulse project at UCLA and the University of Arizona's tech law program. Our topic for today is the filter bubble, or maybe the echo chamber. The notion that we are living in social world, worlds that are increasingly narrow, tightly connected, and homogeneous in the people we interact with, the ideas and values we engage, and even what we believe and the facts we experience about the world. Uh, this idea has been around about 10 years. In various accounts, it might be caused by the mere fact of interacting online, or it might be attributed to specific design and algorithmic choices of the particular social media platforms that we interact with. And crucially, it might happen without any choice on our part, or perhaps even without any knowledge on our part of the circumscription and narrowing of our worlds. Um, now, as I mentioned, the idea has been around about 10 years, but like so many ideas that get catchy slogans and titles that everybody thinks they understand, it gets more interesting and complex the closer you look at it. And so today we're going to dig into a few of the big questions posed by the notion of the filter bubble. Is it a real thing? Is it different from long familiar uh, mechanisms and processes of social interaction? If it is, what causes it? And what effects is it having for our social, economic, and political lives? And if it's doing bad things, what, if anything, can be done about it? Now, here to discuss this, we have a fabulous collection of four panelists who have written on these and a bunch of closely related questions, uh, including, if you've not already seen them, every one of our panelists has written something that we've put up on the link that was connected to the announcement of today's event. So I hope many of you attending here today have seen these already. If you haven't, I urge you to go look at them. Uh, our four panelists are Professor Jane Bambauer, who's a professor at the University of Arizona Law School, where she studies the social impacts of big data and the impacts of privacy laws. Um, next to Jane on my screen is Mark Lemley, who's a professor at Stanford Law, where he directs Stanford's program in law science and technology. Uh, going around the circle on my screen, we have my screen. We <laughs> on my screen we have David Breen. <laughs> screen we have David Brin, who is an astrophysicist, uh, a renowned science fiction author, and also a an award winning and really notable author of some really uh, interesting speculative nonfiction in addition to his great fiction, um, including some that touches on the role of information technology in large social trends. And then last but absolutely not least, my colleague Eugene Volokh at UCLA Law School, a uh, professor here and a well-known blogger on legal issues. So um, uh, we'll proceed as follows. Uh, we have a total of 90 minutes today, wrapping up at 3 o'clock p.m. Pacific. Uh, I'm going to invite each of our four speakers to make a few brief opening remarks. Um, then we will have a free-flowing conversation among the panelists. After about 30 minutes or so, uh, during which I will be monitoring the Q&A line, um, uh, I will start curating and feeding in questions and comments that come from other participants to tee them up for the panelists to discuss. So um, if you are listening in and you want to uh, introduce a question or comment, please pass it on through Zoom's Q&A screen, not by raising your hand, not by using the chat. The chat is active for all participants, but uh, we won't be able to monitor it closely in addition to the other streams going on. Um, and I'll wrap us up promptly at 3 o'clock p.m. And I'm going to have to learn my own lesson and ignore the numerical increase in the chat function. Ah, thank you, Scott, for confirming that you can see and hear everyone, because that's the one thing I was worried about. Okay, so <laughs> this actually rewards my attending to the chat. Okay, uh, that's done with my introductory uh, remarks. Let's turn it uh, over to our panelists. And may I ask uh, you to go first, Jane? Yeah, well, so great to see everyone again. I know we're all probably a little um, low on sleep and, and whatnot, but the topic today uh, is it nat has natural connection to the tight election, the very close election that we're witnessing too. 
so uh, the filter bubble, I'm going to use the filter bubble. You're, you're right that <laughs> I think most of us use that term somewhat loosely and we kind of know what we mean, but if we define it with some precision, we might find that that actually with the precision come a lot of different implications rather, you know, but, um, but I think, you know, the, the original idea was that we, we, is that because of the nature of how we can access information now, we might each as individuals see very different information and no longer see a sort of um, a, a, a broad shared, broadly shared, more, you know, representative in the sense that uh, it's more representative of the information as a whole uh, set of material. Um, and I, I think with time though, people have rightly started using the term to mean something a little bit looser than that, which is that even if, even if we're seeing information that has more overlap than the term filter bubble once suggested, we have kind of our own mental filters going on too, where we, we don't credit some information as much as we credit others. And, and there is a kind of relationship between how we use the internet and the filtering that's going on in our mind. Uh, and so that sort of captures the idea that not only are we in different information spaces, but we, but, but, but we might also just be um, in different, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in different um, relationships with the information that we do see, even if it's the same information. So, uh, so I, I think that's, yes, I think that's real. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to uh, my thoughts on what its sources are. But maybe more importantly, I also think polarization is real. There's been some suggestion that polarization is mostly in the affective sort, meaning that we all feel worse about people who, who we disagree with. But if you look at the actual policy preferences, that hasn't changed that much. But then there are other things, but then there's other evidence that that's not right, that actually beliefs, beliefs and policy preferences have also been um, sort, sorting, sorting closer to the edges. Uh-oh, we lost David. Um, he'll come back, I think. Um, and uh, the reason I got, the reason I've started writing about filter bubbles is that I have thought that the common uh, explanations for its sources are they're not necessarily wrong. First of all, very hard to interpret. I think, <laughs> I think even, even if you have a good sense of all the evidence available, it's really hard to put it together and it's pretty messy. Uh, but but I thought it misses something, uh, the, especially in, in response to the 2016 election, there was so much emphasis on the role of algorithms in, at Facebook or Twitter in um, kind of providing everyone some tunnel vision um, or um, causing sort of man manipulatively causing people to be more, um, you know, more reactive and more uh, misinformed than they otherwise would be. Uh, and, uh, and, and the common explanations uh, that, that kind of in, in intersect with how algorithms work is that people uh, have, have biases. We have sort of cognitive limitations. We, one of the biases is that we don't like taking seriously or thinking about or even being confronted by information that runs against our prior beliefs. Um, and also we are somewhat tribal that we, you know, when, when there is a kind of co cultural coalition forming around an idea, we start getting real mean and defending it from attack. And, 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 and I, think, I think some of that may be happening, but what, what didn't seem convincing to me was that I know, I, I feel like pers my personal experience <laughs> kind of led me to work in this area because I know too many people who are thoughtful and well-informed who, um, who nevertheless uh, have come to believe things that seem to, seem to me at least to be not accurate and the information that would dispel those beliefs is very readily available. Uh, and, and so it couldn't be, and by the way, this, you know, ob observing this made me of course, uh, profoundly nervous that I'm doing it too, and I'm sure I am. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so I, I, I started wondering if there's some explanation that, um, that goes beyond the idea that white supremacist groups or advertisers or other people with some particular mission can 
uh, exploit algorithms and exploit people basically to get them to shift their beliefs because it just seems to me that this, uh, this effect is too common for, for that for those types of explanations. So the, the theory that I'm working out, um, uh, it, it, which is not incompatible with the things I've said, raised already and that um, and, and uh, is that it's actually something about the nature of ordinary friendships that can lead to these uh, to this polarization. And what Facebook and Twitter and uh, other platforms do primarily, is allow us to be in constant contact with friends in a way that we didn't used to be able to have. Um, and so it can cause sort of epistemic failure for two, two reasons. One reason is that even if we're all super rational, even if we're constantly doing Bayesian updating, <laughs> um, if you're getting information from friends who tend to be a little bit more like you and even if they independently go find information themselves and share it with you, you just might wind up with slightly um, maldistributed uh, forms of evidence. And then over time that can have a real effect, even if you're, like I said, um, as long as you're somewhat ignorant about the misrepresentation, you know, misrepresentative nature of the evidence you're getting, if you're in, a, in every other way really rational, you can wind up with wacky beliefs. On top of that, though, I also do believe some of the, the tribalism and, and, and bias literature, um, but the way I'd put it maybe is that we are under some pressure that is you know, probably <laughs> hardwired um, to, to want our friends to think well of us. And so there's also some social pressure that could conflict with you know, with with what would otherwise be a genuine interest in getting the epistem epistemics correct. Uh, so that's what I've been focusing on. And I don't think it necessarily um, it, it's not incompatible with other theories. But if you buy into this as being at least a major cause, then the policy solutions, the implications are you know a little bit bleak, <laughs> and the policy solutions do not look like the sort of, you know, do not look like Facebook needs to just put more warnings uh, on top of um, tweet, uh, on top of posts that have misinformation in it. That's, that's not going to do it. So, so I'll stop there, but. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, Shane. Uh, now, uh, I figured I'd invite uh, opening remarks in a sort of a temporal or tech order. I mean, Jane and her colleagues have this fabulous draft paper that advances the argument she's making. Mark and Eugene, you guys have this paper on the legal implications of virtual and augmented reality that is a set of similar issues moved forward kind of one step in terms of tech capability and its consequences. And then David, we've read your fabulous story about a world where the, the sort of the tech capabilities and the state coercion associated with control of social networks and engagement is taken to an extreme. So I'd, I'd like to invite you folks in kind of in that order to layer on it. Feel free to comment and engage anything Jane's raised but I'd also invite you to kind of extend in the direction that your own work has. So, uh, so what, Mark, would you like to yeah, ask? Sure, let me, uh, let me step in on that. So I, let, me, let me sort of start with, uh, with where Jane is and, um, and then sort of maybe start to think about different types of filter bubbles and how we might feel differently about them. Uh, so humans have always lived in filter bubbles, right? And in fact, for the vast majority of human history, we lived in much, more hermetically sealed filter bubbles than we did right now. The people you talk to for most of human history were the people who lived in your small village. They were the people who went to your church and uniformity of thought was assumed, right? If you were in fact the rare person who uh, dissented from the uniformity of thought in your filter bubble, you were often ostracized completely, uh, right? You could be excommunicated, you could be driven out of the village. Um, and so it, it, this is not a sort of internet phenomenon. And I think the first thing we need to start with is, right, this is, the internet has not done this to us. Um, even as we broaden our cultural uh, uh, horizons, right, as, as we get into the modern world, I think that remains true, although the size of the filter can expand. Um, moving people to cities, having them interact with people from different nationalities, from different regions, actually was a big opening. 
Um, but one of the ways we responded to that, I think, was to just sort of broaden the filter bubble, right? The filter bubble of, um, of three television networks in the 1950s and 1960s was, in one sense, what we think of today as the opposite, right? It's, oh, America got the same universal cultural experience, but they didn't get the same cultural experience as Russia uh, or China uh, or Brazil. Uh, and in fact, information, right, sort of started to, uh, we, we had a very strong set of filter bubbles uh, that were built around national ideology. One of the things I think the internet did uh, is uh, break open the existing uh, sort of community filter bubbles that we all lived in, right, whether it was church or town or country uh, uh, or, or university or job. Uh, and expose us to a sort of amazing array of different things, right? And that is, a, that, that seems to me sort of in general a good thing, um, but it's not surprising that a group of people who have sort of evolved in a tribal uh, world and have lived uh, uh, for most of human history in sort of small groups and tribes uh, uh, starts to build its own set of tribes on the internet. Uh, and so I think, right, part of what we're doing is sort of recreating uh, uh, groups, but I think we're recreating groups with some of the benefits of not having a filter bubble. What the internet has brought to us is both the ability to sort of find your own group and your own community, not I have been plunked in this village or in this church because of where I was born and who my parents were, uh, but uh, I have found a group of people who look, uh, look like me, think like me, uh, have the same interest as me, whatever it is that interests me. Um, uh, and I can do that in the context of a larger universe that has all of these different uh, uh, people to it. So that is on one hand a great thing, right? Uh, if you are the sort of only gay teenager in your small rural high school, the ability to find a community uh, to generate a bubble of people who are uh, who don't ostracize you, who don't view you as the other, uh, is an extraordinarily good thing. Um, if you are the only uh, uh, believer in QAnon lunacy uh, in your small town uh, uh, at university, uh, the ability to find other people like you seems to us a much less good thing. But from your perspective, of course, it is a great thing, right? You are no longer ostracized and mocked for your beliefs. Uh, that no one around you shares. I, I, I want to flag a couple of things that, that, that the sort of internet does that sort of may worry us uh, about this, but then I also want to distinguish um, uh, two kinds of filter bubbles we live in today, the ones we choose and the ones we don't choose, right? Uh, one of the things the internet did is it opened up the opportunity for us to choose our filter bubbles. That was largely untrue for most of human history, um, uh, and indeed for sort of portions of, of our lifetimes. My sense is that we ought to be more worried about uh, the filter bubbles we don't choose, the ones that are chosen for us, than the ones we do choose. Um, and so here, here we might worry about some of the literature on, the, on social media and reaction. Uh, if we think we're being programmed, pushed in particular directions, that seems bad. I'm not sure that there is as much of that as people think. Uh, frankly, a lot of the uh, uh, backlash against Facebook and the tech industry in the wake of 2016 election was an unwillingness to con confront the fact that uh, a substantial number of people in this country uh, believed things very different than, uh, uh, than we thought they did. Uh, but it is also the case that, as Charles Strauss has said, um, uh, you know, Facebook is good at serving us the things that keep us engaged to it. Uh, and the things that keep us engaged may not be the things we like. They may be the things we sort of uh, are horrified by, are outraged or disgusted by. Those are the things we focus attention on. And if that's right, those are the things we're going to see. Uh, so we might end up with a filter bubble, not of everyone sort of uh, agreeing uh, and living in a happy community, uh, but a sort of filter bubble in which um, a, a bunch of liberals are confronted with uh, uh, the outrages of conservatism and a bunch of conservatives are confronted with the outrages of liberalism because those are the things that engage you, get you to respond, get you to comment on posts, get you to spend more time on the site and therefore see more ads. That strikes me as something we might worry about, right? Because this is not a choice you are making. 
But I also think we are making filter bubble choices in ways that, while I hope people will make them responsibly, and I don't think they always will, it's much harder to, to criticize for making that decision. And, you know, as Jane says, you, you, you have a bunch of friends on uh, uh, Facebook, but it's not just that you see a bunch, you see your friends more on Facebook or you have more friends uh, that you're in touch with on Facebook. It's that friends you would have seen in one context and only communicated with about certain things turn out to be visible to you in all of their uh, range of beliefs, including their political beliefs, their religious beliefs, their QAnon beliefs, and so forth. Uh, and so I think part of what we've done is actually open up um, uh, things that were largely kept sort of hidden uh, in sort of normal non-online human friendships, some of the response to that is to build a filter bubble. It's to say, you know what, right? You seemed like a nice person when our kids went to play at daycare together. We had some nice chats about parenting, right? But now that I know what you believe about X, Y, or Z, I'm not sure I actually sort of think of you in the same way, and I'm not sure I want you to be a friend. And that doesn't strike me as a bad thing, right? That strikes me as a sort of information generating things that change people's views. More interesting, and this gets both to Jean's in my article and then is I think gonna lead into David's, uh, is the idea of sort of building a personal filter bubble that simply excludes some interaction uh, with the outside world. We do that if we unfriend people, if we block people on Twitter because they are, uh, are harassing us. Uh, Gene and I talk in the article about the sort of possibilities that have already been built into some virtual reality systems uh, that you could simply exclude a harasser from your virtual reality environment. Uh, not sort of excluding them from VR, but excluding them from your view of VR. Uh, you can literally build uh, blinders uh, that prevent you from seeing certain offensive things. I can see why you would worry that a world in which people only see the things that their blinders allow them to see uh, is troubling. I think we're very far from that world. And I think there's actually some benefit to the idea that I can actually uh, just weed out, block out uh, the, the racism or the sexual harassment that is directed at people on a daily basis um, and live a more productive life as a result. With that, I'll stop. Um, that's great. Yeah, Eugene, you want to pick up from there and then we'll turn to David? Sure, sure. Um, uh, I'm happy to have David go first. It just sounded like it was like I was in line after, or I was asked to be after Mark. Does that make sense? No? Okay, yeah. never mind. David, David say go, go ahead. I say, you and Mark are co-authors, so it's like you, you get to sort of rebut or elaborate on- I'm gonna say, which, well, which you shouldn't yeah. assume we agree, right? I think, I think everything I say is consistent with everything everybody has said and will say. Oh, but I <laughs> Now and forever on all issues at all places. Oh, just like a faculty so I think meeting. We have met the enemy and he is us. That's part of the problem. That there are various problems that we can solve because they are the result of things that are clearly bad. And if we only stop them, then that would be great. Uh, spread of communicable disease might be an example of that. There may be disagreement about it. And sometimes it might happen as a result of things like cities and such, but still you, sort of, you know what the problem is. And it's not like people are really into spreading communicable disease. So if you only figure things out, maybe, maybe things will get better. You can make a vaccine. You can't make a vaccine for filter bubbles because filter bubbles are a consequence of us, of our perfectly normal, reasonable desires to engage with people we like and trust and ideas that we think are sensible. That's perfectly normal. So whom would I rather listen to? Would I rather listen to somebody who agrees me, with me or disagrees with me? Well, if he agrees with me, that probably means he's such a wonderful, reasonable person with quite a sensible view of the world. Whereas if he disagrees with me, there's probably something kind of wrong with him, right? So this is, this is, deep down inside, this is the way things are for, for all of us. So there is this tendency for us naturally to seek out people who are, we're simpatico with, people who are on our wavelength, emotionally, intellectually, ideologically. And that's part of the problem. So part of the problem, you can blame Facebook and Twitter for amplifying certain things, but I take Jane's point, and I think it is quite right, is that one of the things they do is they give us more freedom to hang out with people like us. And as a result, we hang out with people like us and we have less, spend less time around people who are unlike us. So that's the problem. And that's why I think it's a very hard thing to fix. 
Let me suggest it's also exacerbated by two other problems. One uh, is what Timur Koran calls a, a preference falsification. That's when people view themselves as being a, a minority in a particular environment. They speak out further disproportionately to their share. So if it's 50-50, you might have 50% saying something on one side, 50% on another. But if it's 30-70, you're not gonna have 30% of the comments being from the 30% and 70 from the 70. It might be more like 1090 or 595 because the people who are in the minority might feel like, you know, why should I speak up? But I'm obviously in the minority, people will, will bark at me. So only a relatively few people, and maybe some especially extreme people, either from a, extreme ideas or extreme temperaments are going to be the ones who are going to be willing to speak up even though they know they're in the minority. Now that's something that may be kind of a more unfortunate factor of human nature, but it's still a factor of human nature. Um, and uh, um, so, so those I think are, are very serious problems. So one question is what to do about it and being kind of a temperamentally a Burkean, I start thinking what has been done about it. And I totally agree with Mark by the way, that what has often been done is we've lived in our filter bubbles, usually much narrower filter bubbles throughout human history than there are now. But there have been attempts to try to do some things about it. So for example, there was something of a norm among newspapers that while their editorial pages would have a particular viewpoint, there would be rival views also carried on that page. Partly for the benefit of of readers that especially if there was one newspaper in town, they don't understand that have readers of different ideologies, but also part of the, let's say partly for the benefit of readers who want to see that particular view, but partly so that everybody might by accident run across something they wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, uh, note, I believe that was not the norm in uh, all publications. So for example, I believe magazines of opinion maybe occasionally have had some kind of counter programming within them deliberately, but I think nobody expected that they that necessarily do that. Another example is universities. I think in many respects, universities have historically tried to, uh, to set up things where they deliberately try to set up panels, debates, invite speakers precisely because they are in disagreement with, uh, with uh, the, the, the norm as it were. So they help puncture the filter bubble because the university saw itself, saw its role as trying to expose uh, uh, the students to a wide range of ideas. Now, not unlimited range, uh, uh, especially, uh, especially clear in the sciences, but I think this would be true. In all disciplines, you know, you don't want a panel. You can't have a panel with all views represented, but you don't even really want a panel with all views represented. You trust the university to do a pretty decent job of focusing on those views that are most interesting, most helpful, most likely to be consistent with objective reality to the extent that that's relevant in this discipline. Uh, but at the same time, something of a mix. And my sense is that both of these norms, perhaps the norm is to newspapers has gone the way of newspapers. And the fact that people read things online, not from one newspaper, from a bunch of sources may, may exacerbate that. Uh, but in universities, my sense is that uh, that norm has sh sharply retreated. And the sense is that to the extent there's a diversity of views presented, it's mostly diversities from, let's say, the far left, and I don't use that as a normative condemnation, though I disagree with it, but that's just descriptively far left, to basically the center left. Um, uh, so, so, and why? I think for the same reasons that filter bubbles are so appealing to us, because of course people at universities think, well, we should only invite people who have reasonable views, right? Why should we inflict on our students stupid, evil, offensive views? Well. The problem is it's human nature to sort of assume, especially when already there's been a good deal of polarization reps driven by pre-existing filter bubbles, to assume that of course people on the other side uh, are, are, not, are not somebody who's worth letting into our bubble. And let me just close with one last point because there's a normative perspective here and there's a descriptive one. And there's, so, so, one, so um, or actually let me recast it a bit. Uh, um, one reason you might want to avoid filter bubbles is that things outside the filter bubble may actually be true. So I would like to think that serious scholars in science, for example, and my sense is serious scholars in law, try hard to read things they disagree with because of the possibility that they are wrong. It's hard because before scholars or anything else, they are human. 
and no human wants to be wrong. Uh, but perhaps to avoid being publicly wrong, they might say, look, let me open up the possibility, maybe I'm privately wrong, but I'll correct my views so that when I go public with them, I'm gonna be right. Um, so that's one reason uh, um, why you wanna avoid filter bubble. But the other reason is that it's important to know what is being thought on a wide range of ideas, a uh, wide range of topics. Um, even if you think it's wrong, even if you're quite certain it's wrong. That's particularly true for, uh, for, for lawyers, that lawyers, when they need to persuade people, they need to persuade people who are not them, right? You have to persuade third party. That could be the members of a jury. It could be the members of a court. And knowing where they're coming from is really important and understanding it and being able to kind of see the world in some measure from their perspective, benighted as it may be deplorable as it may be. We can't afford the luxury of ignoring that if we're going to be good lawyers. Um, so, so one thing that I wish at least some institutions would do is recognize that basically so long as 30% of the public believes something, that is something that we need to make sure the remaining 70% let into their filter bubble. There's a downside because if that something is stupid, then maybe it'll make the 70% a little more stupid. Uh, maybe it'll also so upset the remaining 70% that they'll just stop reading things, stop going to the debate and listen. And then the result is less net enlightenment. But on the other hand, if you let the 70% sort of assume the 30% doesn't exist, or maybe you let the 30% assume the 70% doesn't exist because they are, that 30% is a majority within their own little environment, but not within the country as a whole, the consequence is people find it very hard to even accomplish their own moral goals and their own practical goals for lack of an understanding of sort of the, the reality of the diversity of views. How is that going to solve the problem? I mean, I, I, I'm not, I don't know. There's a reason why we've gotten to the point where we've gotten, but I do think that the only way to fight it precisely because it is such a normal human condition is to sort of self-conscious attempts by the part, especially of institutions to try to reach out beyond the filter bubble. And that's what my sense is that it's been on the decline in recent times. Oh, that's great. Uh, our, our table is heaped full of a feast of fabulous stuff to follow up on in discussion. And, and David is now going to add, I, I don't know if it's fair to say you're serving up dessert to David, but, but uh, feel free to pile on here and then let's go around and pick out the most interesting things to dig in further on. David, please, and you're muted. Yes, I was muted indeed. I got bumped. You saw my, my picture disappear for a little while. My computer crashed. <laughs> and I'm hoping it won't in this case. Um, Jane posed the problem, I think, very well. I agree with all three of my compatriots here in different ways. <clears throat> Though, as you might guess, I you know, take a little bit of a very wide perspective it comes from the science fiction training, not only thinking about the future, but you'll often hear me speak about the 6,000 years of, that we roughly have of history, uh, or a little over 4,000 in, in actually recorded history. And during that time, these, these uh, bubble systems, as Mark pointed out, um, were solved by the elites in the society, a pyramidal shaped elites, the few at the top, made darn sure that the gossips lower down would report any deviations of behavior by those down below so that, they, so that those could be squashed because those threatened the power of those at top. And of course that resulted in very bad governance across 99% of those societies because the only way you can avoid delusionary errors, even if you're a very bright king, a very smart king, is criticism. And yet we reflexively repress criticism. Now, throughout history, it was kings and nobles repressing criticism, but also laterally. And that's what we're talking about today. The repression of criticism and uncomfortable ideas laterally. Now, the Chinese think we're crazy not to do this all the time. They are instituting social credit so that laterally um, conformity is enforced on, on, on their citizens 98% of the time laterally so that the state doesn't have to be Orwellian with an iron boot, but can instead be a little more like Huxley in, in, uh, in uh, Brave New World 
uh, dispensing favors and pleasure and only occasionally killing people to enforce um, the top. Now, Jean spoke of uh, something that's very important and that is the rebuttal rule. Um, now, most of the time in, in American history, newspapers did not have that habit of uh, giving space to all reasonably um, centrist uh, positions um, on the editorial pages. But post-World War II, we were used to that. Just as post-World War II, Gandhi and Martin Luther King credited the news cameras, especially TV cameras, with saving their lives, as well as spreading their messages. Um, the uh, television actually is probably the only exception to, uh, you might call it Britain's rule, uh, and that is, because I don't know anybody else who pointed it out, and that is that if you look at every time we've had new breakthroughs in what humans can do technologically with information, uh, books uh, allowing us to have prosthetic knowledge outside our skulls, uh, eyeglasses and glass lenses for telescopes, etc., letting us ex vastly expand vision, and perspective, which allowed us to expand what we can pay attention to. Uh, the first time this happened with the printing press, it did not result in what the optimists expected, which was everybody becoming more elevated. It did eventually, always the optimists prove right over the long run, but always the pessimists prove right in the short run, and that is that people are, um, are, are disheveled and, and, and upset and uh, their equilibrium is upset by this tsunami, this fire hose of new information. And it almost killed us in the 1930s when radios and loudspeakers vastly expanded the power of the reach of, of gifted uh, orators. Uh, and we were lucky in the West, in the, especially in the English speaking world that they happened to be on our side, but it wasn't always the case overseas. Um, so, the post-World War II tradition of the uh, rebuttal rule by journalistic standards was augmented by law in the television systems and radio systems that were um, had to satisfy certain laws uh, allowing rebuttal rules. And, and some of us grew up here, Jane is too young, but there was a time before Fox uh, got the law changed when um, there had to be a couple of minutes of rebuttal for every hour of ranting by the owners of the, um, of the network. And this, I would say, would be a, a top priority to reinstall. And this is one of the major parts of what I call the FACT Act, which folks will find a link to um, down at the bottom of the screen, because uh, I think there is only one issue, and that is the restoration of the ex actual existence of FACT. Now, uh, and let's bear in mind, speaking on what Jean said, that the left um, has also done some repression of deviance, of, de of, of variability of opinion and debate. Um, nowhere near as bad, but uh, we have to be wary of the people who trashed the offices of uh, conservative professors on some university campuses because they just drove Walt Bowitz and Mitzi and Pearl and Edelman and that lot off campus where they, on campus they were being moderated by interaction with their colleagues and they went to faux academes like Heritage Foundation where they became the, the neoconservatives. And we all know where that led. Now, uh, last, um, the, the, the link that people were offered was to a uh, science fiction short story of mine called Insistence of Vision, in which um, a, a breakthrough in what you can see and know that technology is enabled everybody, on all citizens on the street, to be able to just use augmented reality and just use a blink and a mumbled command and be able to get anything they want unless they're criminals. But criminals aren't sent to prison anymore. They are blinded and given Geordi LaForge Star Trek visors that cannot see most doors and cannot see most children and, can, and, and only see blurs uh, of people. So they can have jobs and work in daily life but not do any harm. It's a, it's a scary, creepy future that's better than ours. What can you say? That's often the case in science fiction. Now, speaking of science fiction, 
This whole topic about the filter bubble was discussed, and I can't see if this is actually going through. Oh, yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's working. In my novel, Earth, in which in 1989, I had web pages. How's that for prediction? Um, but in addition to that, I talked about how the internet would uh, empower filter bubbles, eventually leading to vast millions of people occupying what were effectively, I call them because it is highly pejorative and it makes the point, I call them mini online Nuremberg rallies because people are seeking out uh, sameness and uh, chance. Now we are a species who spent most of our development doing incantations. That's why magic is so enthralling to us. In fact, it's an amazing thing to me that we were able finally to find some alternatives to the standard pyramidal culture with kings and priests and kept in place by magical incantations and, and romantic thinking. It happens that humanity has an alternative to that attractor state. It's only happened about 10th of a percent of the time, but Periclean Athens, da, Vin uh, da Vinci's Florence, um, uh, 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 the, the Netherlands during the 17th century and so on, these things showed that we're capable of something different. Uh, counter incantations of reciprocal accountability. Now, um, Mark spoke of how in the past conformity was laterally or up or top down enforced. Um, and this resulted in a common narrative. Unless you were the empire over the mountains, in which case the, you were absolutely evil. Look at Tolkien and Star Wars and all the other romantic images that we have from fantasy. The enemy soldiers have no mothers. Orcs don't have mothers. Uh, Stormtroopers, clones certainly don't have mothers. Robot soldiers don't have mothers. So you can mow them down with the impunity and the lack of compassion and empathy that um, the Nazi propaganda and the, and the Japanese imperial propaganda uh, had their soldiers so, um, so unempathic. Whereas if you look at why we fight by Capra and, and, and Ford and the, the other World War II propaganda films, they urged courage and determination but you can take some pride that they also said, we're sad that we have to go and kill these men. And we hope someday we can be friends. That's a different way of looking at things. It's more complex and it's worth defending. Now, if you look at the propaganda that we are raised under in the West, if you look at Hollywood films, and I mentioned this in the last of our uh, sessions, there are several basic me um, messages. One is suspicion of authority, SOA. It is in, you have to oppose an authority figure, whether it's, whether it's, it's, it's Thanos or it's a mother-in-law in some chick flick uh, rom-com. There's some authority figure that has to be faced. Eccentricity, the principal character displays some eccentricity that calls upon the audience to expand. Uh, tolerance, diversity, individuality. The Chinese think that Hollywood films spread insanity because those are all things that they deem to be fundamentally at odds with serenity. And they may be right. They may be right that we're, uh, that we're crazy, uh, but ain't it cool? Uh, and besides which, if 99% of human cultures fell into um, the feudal trap. That's all the more reason to try the other thing because that never worked for us and it probably doesn't work for all the species that are caught in that same genetic attractor state, Darwinian attractor state, uh, all across the galaxy. If the galaxy is to have one chance, it's probably our rebel methods. But our enemies have found meticulously and systematically how to use suspicion of authority against us and metastasize it and turn it into a cancer, which is what we're experiencing right now. If you're on the right, you 
conceive of your the left's authority figures as being Sauron level evil and your uh, authorities uh, as being unquestionable. And it's pretty much the same from the left perspective as well. This methodology of holding each other accountable has been used against us. Now, last time we spoke of anonymity and pseudonymity and how it might be possible to get a positive sum outcome. And this is the most important of all the concepts today. And that is, if you're not aware of the difference between positive sum games and zero sum or even negative sum games, that's the only homework assignment you have. And most of the people listening in at this sort of level are, are probably familiar with the concept and they take it seriously. And I think that's amazing because there's no reason from the, from the genetic history, the evolutionary history or the history history of, of humanity that positive sum games should come naturally to people. And yet they do seem to come naturally to Americans when we're not in one of the phases of our civil war. Now, I have one last thing to point out and a thing that people can click to down at the bottom is my disputation arenas concept. The way out, the way to get a positive sum out of this is by doing what gives us positive sum outputs in the other competitive arenas that we have in our society. And they are markets, democracy, science, justice courts, and sports. And in all five of these arenas, vast, vast creativity has been unleashed in the last 80 years by creating systems that are flat and fair and open and also in which you cannot, your company cannot, your political party cannot, your, your science uh, professors cannot, your uh, uh, opponents in you know, the courts and your opponents on the field cannot do what humans always do, and that is cheat their way to victory. Uh, you may be cynical out there and say that there's cheating going on in all of these things, and they are, and it is, especially lately. But the fundamental wonderful discovery was that if you use transparency, as I talk about in the transparent society, and that I also talk about in Earth, is in a transparent situation, competitors will apply transparency and light to use accountability to find each other's mistakes. Something's wrong with your product, your adversary will announce it. Well, believe me, this is the case in science, <laughs> the most competitive of all fields. Um, and in elections, it's supposed to happen, God willing it has, um, and so on. So what I'm saying is each of these five arenas have something that the internet doesn't have and that would break these filter bubbles while allowing positive sum to get the benefits that Gene and Mark were talking about. And that is reciprocal account accountability through ritual combat. It used to be that you you'd call somebody <laughs> out to, to ritual combat uh, to prove something in the Middle Ages. It didn't prove a damn thing. But we have ritual combat in markets called the marketplace. Uh, we have ritual combat called elections. We have ritual combat called the, the uh, pr uh, publisher parish in science. We have ritual co combat called the, the, the courtroom. And we have ritual combat every Saturday in every sporting league and regulations and umpires to make sure that the cheating is kept down to a dull roar. When you have ritual combat, you can find out what's true. And that is the real problem with these Nuremberg rallies, with these filter bubbles, is the assassination of fact. To the extent that we now don't, most of us don't even believe that things are called facts are things. And they are, and, and so I recommend some methods by which we can get this 
ritual combat thing that happens in science, in democracy, in, in, in markets, in, in justice courts, and in, and in sports. We've refined the methods. If we can get ritual combat between some of these Nuremberg rallies and have it be a shame of cowardice if they don't engage in ritual combat over fact, we might be able to elect, have the positive sum outcome of people being able to refine their own communities, but also having their smug incantations smashed when they are, when they are toxic and pathological and above all untrue. So I yammered on, I yammered on, and, and I'm but sorry. You yammered on in a creative and uh, fabulously stimulating way as ever, David. Thank you all. We have a vast and complex feast of things to discuss, and I absolutely don't want to lose the chance to come back to the kind of solutions discussion that we've had over the past couple of minutes and has come in in a few questions. But at the risk of being pedestrian, I want to go way back near the start, because Jane, said, you said something and then sort of passed on quickly that I, I heard resonating through all the subsequent speakers' remarks. Uh, you said, we need to distinguish a contraction of our information space from a contraction of our trust space. And I'm thinking of that a little bit more and listening to really everyone's comments subsequently, I was thinking the, the most pernicious characterization, if, uh, assuming the filter bubble is real, new and different, and new and different in a pernicious way, and I acknowledge those are all contestable assumptions, I think what people have in mind is perhaps even more than a contraction and a convergence of information space. It's something beyond the trust space. It's, it's a, a kind of a normative uh, cabining off of values leading to people perceiving the others, those outside their group or bubble, to be less than legitimate, not, not merely not trustworthy, but less than legitimate, less than fully human. And in fact, I see uh, Dan Lizotte has sent in a question about, wait a sec, you're all talking about filter bubbles for facts. What about filter bubbles for values? Hi, Dan, great question, great pull out of the speaker's comments. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, is, is that also a phenomenon? Can you think of it similarly in terms of causation and consequences? And do you find it persuasive that that is a more pernicious, a more socially destructive phenomenon? Uh, I get it. I think you don't agree with this, David, because you, you, you so strongly emphasize her convergence on fact. But, uh, and I absolutely want to come back there too. But So can I, 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 can I jump in on that? So I, I, I mean, Yes, it's a, it's, it's a terrible thing to worry about. Once again, right, it's worth remembering we have done this throughout the entirety of human history. Um, and I think we do it less now than we have at almost any previous time in the past, right? Um, so our sort of, our value filter bubbles in the past uh, literally derided large segments of the population as subhuman or non-human for most of human history, right? Whether they were slaves or women or the tribe across the mountain uh, or something else, right? And that still happens, but it happens a lot less than it used to. And I, I, I think we're reconstructing some of that in the course of a sort of very contested a uh, set of political uh, uh, debates in the last several years, but I don't think we're reconstructing it to that same level. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, one of the one of the things a, val a filter bubble of values can give you is, um, I guess, the same sort of insulation from challenge that David is talking about. But I'm more worried about the um, about the uh, rejection of, of fact, the rejection of evidence, uh, than I am about sort of the rejection uh, the, the rejection of the other, right? Because I think that's um, because I think we've we've sort of seen throughout sort of at least American, but I think most of human history, right? Sort of improvement on the uh, on the values um, uh, front. Uh, and right now, it seems like we're going backwards on the facts front, uh, and that's the thing that worries me. Well, I'd like to hear what Jane has to say uh, about this, but if I can just point out or do a remise on something I said earlier, and that is that we tend to assume Hollywood values. In other words, when you're discussing values, you tend to assume the ones 
that you like, that you've suckled all your life. And everybody on this screen and probably everybody listening in right now grew up suckling uh, uh, some degree of suspicion of authority, but above all, the, uh, those ones I mentioned, eccentricity, tolerance, diversity, individuality, but above all the notion that it is a positive thing to expand horizons of inclusion. Now it's been a grudging 240 year process for Americans to actually do it, but it's always been part of our mythology. I think you'll find, Mark, that if you really imbue yourself in the things that are being published in, in out of Beijing and Moscow right now and, and Riyadh and a lot of other places, this is the thing they hate most about us. And that is that Hollywood, they have to succeed in, in making us fail now because if Hollywood con continues to influence their generations with this alluring mess set of messages, um, the pyramidal system will be toast, whatever its trappings and, and colorations or I Ching or, 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 or whatever it is, um, the colorations won't matter because it will be diamond shaped and not pyramidal. Um, and, and so the values, yes, values are terribly important, but most of those values I just described have also been used against us, but with meticulous and surgical effectiveness. But um, I, I've, been, I've been blabbing and blabbing. I'm going to go to mute now. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can come back anytime. Jane, it looks like you've got some I'm problems. sort of surprised that we're, that at least so far, um, we are all sort of emphasizing uh, differences in fact over differences in value, but I'm, I'm going to add to that. Um, part, part of the reason, by the way, I, I'm somewhat prepared because when Jack Balkan read the, the draft that, that I shared with you, his, you know, his take was that we're actually in filter bubbles of values. And my instinctive reaction was that I think it has more to do with differences in facts. Like if we actually all agreed on whether grievances are factually justified, we would then the values, you know, the, um, the, 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 at least the significance of the values differences would, would greatly reduce. Um, and, you know, run, sort of running through the discussion uh, about filter bubbles, it's like, what, what, okay, so what's the problem with living in different universes? Well, the problem is that we sort of have complex interconnected interests in what other people think. And, and so there are these spillover effects based on what other people think, both in terms of what they think is factually true and then also their values. I, I you know, um, it, we, we could sort of combine those for a minute. Um, and so, um, but, but, uh, but I don't think that the values and the, and the facts are very well separated. And in fact, one thing that David said that I was surprised to hear was that he thought science is still doing a good job of, of, of having these battles where everyone agrees on what it means to win. And I think for the hard sciences, that's true. But for the soft sciences, that's definitely not true. <laughs> no, that's definitely not true. If you think about not just the replication crisis, uh, but, um, but even, you know, not just the replication crisis if you happen to have access to data, uh, but, um, but, but even the fact that, um, the, that, 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 that getting the information, basically figuring out what is and is not true is, is, is extremely hard when what you wanna study are people. And what are, are the spillover effects that I think we're most worried about are theories, factual theories that people have that do have to do with people. <laughs> and so it's really the economic and social science theories uh, and the facts related to those that are the most critical and where, where science in the form of sort of, you know, academic practices have, have still not managed to create this, this fair boxing ring, um, uh, the way that sort of physicists can actually, you know, reproduce and figure out whether what someone says is actually true or not. I didn't say that uh, it, uh, that those five arenas weren't in crisis. Oh, okay. They are in crisis. <laughs> to democracy markets are in terrible crisis. Well, at least with democracy. So I thought what you meant by that was that at least 
you know, I, I guess this is, this is potentially iffy, but at least at least we feel confident in, in who has won some democratic contest. Well, yeah, by crisis, I didn't mean they had failed. Okay. <laughs> but but sports, sports are the archetype because sports proves that both the far left's oversimplification and the far right's oversimplification are wrong. You, you don't get good results from competition that's unregulated. And, but you get great results from competition, from competition which means yeah. that the left's cliche is wrong. In all five of these arenas, you get great results from competition that is heavily regulated to reduce the human curse of cheating. All five are in crisis right now, but hopefully we've had some good news about, about the often, often what people fight over most intensely, here, here's, here's an ill thought out and perhaps overgeneralized claim, you know, feel free to pile on. <laughs> Uh, often what we fight over most intensely are, are, are matters of the boundaries of political, legal, and moral consideration. Uh, that even applies, I think, actually uh, in sports, because of course sports, you know, the, the, the most contentious area in contemporary sports is sex and gender in sports and, you know, and what to do with women's sports uh, in the presence of transgendered people. But uh, what strikes me is many of these domains, it's like, these fights don't much turn on empirical questions. They are not utterly unlinked to empirical questions. And I, and I say this advisedly, David, knowing that you have written powerfully about elevation of cognitive abilities of non-human biological species to be peers in capability and all of the social, political, and legal consequences and disruptions that flowed from that. So yes, there's an empirical aspect, but it's not really centrally empirical. It, it, it's about kind of judgments we make that are kind of independent. And I, because I, it's so lively, I'm going to throw in one more thing for people to pick up if they want, especially you, Mark. Are you so confident that the village was as uniform as you think? It's like, I'm only one generation from a couple of people who grew up in villages, you know, rather isolated villages. And I have to say there was this astonishing tension between a surface veneer of uniformity and an extraordinary diversity of actual opinion and value, even toleration of eccentricity of behavior. Maybe that was a uniquely benign characteristic of Canadian villages at a certain, at a certain historical <laughs> moment. But I'm also thinking about you know, the cartoon of the, the gentle English eccentric in the countryside village. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the heroic model of this would be Jim Lovelock retiring to his little private lab on the Dorset coast. Um, but um, the thing about villages is they're small, but they're not self-chosen. And back to you again, Mark, I mean, you identified a disparity between uh, filter bubbles by choice and filter bubbles imposed on you. And I think you appeared to suggest that there's a normative preference for those that are chosen. But of course, you might push back against that and say, those that are chosen are likely to be even narrower. There's a sort of a randomizing element in like the family and the village you're born into that might introduce some of the benefits of having to encounter others. I've, I've sure, thrown yeah. out three or four separate things, but so I'm just going to say discuss. Right, yeah, so uh, fair enough. I, I do think Canada might be different. Um, uh, the, uh, but, but that's not to say there isn't diversity and, I, and, and that you're right that that diversity can come from, certainly if you took a, a random selection of people and plopped them together on a desert island, right? I mean, in as, one as sense- As in a reality TV show. Right, you'd have a filter bubble, right? Uh, but but, but you'd, you'd expect the diversity of viewpoints. To some extent, you can expect the same thing for the village. The question is what happens? To that diversity of viewpoints, and I think I think you're right that sort of we'll tolerate a certain amount of eccentricity, um, uh, particularly by people who otherwise share things in common with us, um, right? The uh, the sort of eccentric uh, in the village who's been there for a while, whose family grew up there, right? Who other, otherwise has ties is very different than the one who turns out to be transgender person of color who moved here a year ago. Uh, and I think that's not an accident, right? And I also think you're right that there's sort of a lot more diversity underneath the surface than that appears on the surface. But of course, that's the whole point of the filter bubble, 
right? It's not that sort of everyone must think exactly the same thing, right? It's that everyone must say the same thing and they must sort of appear to think or, or sort of con confess to the thing. You better go to the church even if you actually secretly have your doubts about whether or not uh, this particular God is your God. Uh, and, um, and so then I think the question is, what does that do? What, what does that do sort of over time to people's beliefs in conformity? And maybe the answer is nothing, but I think probably the answer is something, right? That it is actually, it's not just that it's, uh, Gene says, you know, people talk less about this if they view they're, they're, they're in the minority. I think that's right, but it's not just that they, they say, well, I feel just as strongly, but I don't see that I'm going to persuade anyone and so it's not worth doing it. I think it actually becomes sort of harder to communicate to yourself uh, the same uh, uh, views and the same ideas, right? And so the, the extreme versions of these, of course, are cults, right? Uh, are, are sort of sufficiently insular groups where the, uh, where the sort of story, the, the line is communicated so uh, clearly uh, that uh, even if you've got uh, doubts, you, you've got to keep them to yourself and eventually you start losing those doubts. Or totalitarian uh, states. I mean, Eugene invoked Tamer Karan, whose whole theory of preference falsification was, was based upon the sort of social revolutions against repressive states in Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union, which leads to the question, it's like, uh, what are the, how bad are the harms that flow from being divergent or eccentric? I mean, well, may, maybe cults or the Soviet Union are not good examples because I, I'm inclined to the view that the costs of heterodoxy in a filter bubble community are lower than the cost of heterodoxy in the uh, day they are. And, and so just, I know Gene wants to say something, let me, let me say one, one sentence in response to that, but I, and then I'll, I'll turn over to Gene. I mean, this to me is the reason why I prefer filter bubbles you get to choose from the ones that are imposed on you. You can leave, right? Um, you don't, I mean, like, it may get harder, Right, it may be that if everyone around you believes in QAnon, right, sort of you increasingly do it, but you've got the option to get out. You've got the option to see stuff outside that bubble, uh, and that's much better than a world in which it's imposed from the outside. Sorry, I, I think that's absolutely right. But I wanted to return to the to something that's been implicit also in the last couple of uh, uh, discussions about the fact and idea thing. I think filter bubbles arises to both. I thought we were actually talking about both, but let me suggest there are, that they may be different, but quite related. So I think uh, one feature of filter bubbles about ideas, including moral ideas and other kinds of uh, ideas, maybe not quite moral, ethical, religious, other such things, is in many respects, uh, if we eliminate the filter bubble, we probably, people who, uh, who access the uh, outside things and are willing to take time and to access it might actually learn interesting and important things, figure them out because those ideas are accessible to them in many respects. Uh, so one downside of the filter bubble about, uh, about ideas is you don't think about what possible sensible views there are about all these various questions, sexual orientation, race, uh, um, uh, uh, international politics, various other such things. Um, but as to facts, you know, you could have access to a huge amount of, of facts that are not filtered out by ideological, on ideological grounds. But the trouble is for most of us, we really can't process them because we're not specialist enough in the subject. Uh, so really, as to questions having to do with science, as to questions having to do with fairly complicated issues in economics, uh, um, about the effectiveness of various policing reforms and various other programs, uh, as to those things, I think, filter bubble or no, most of us have to rely on trustworthy experts. And one of the real problems of recent decades, possibly tied in what David was saying, possibly went back to to the question authority, perfectly sensible question authority attitude of the 60s and 70s, uh, is people are questioning authority and people are finding that they're not trusting the experts much. Uh, and it may be bad in many ways, but the problem is you can't just say, well, it's bad for society if we don't trust the experts, so I'm gonna trust the experts because if you think that they're untrustworthy, it's a pretty bad mistake for you to trust them. So here's one way in which I think the two interact. To the extent you think the experts are working in filter bubbles of their own, whether from a perspective that they're not seeing enough things or they're not allowed to say enough things, 
that would leave the experts to be more untrustworthy. So if I thought that, that medical professionals were in an environment, for example, in which anybody who said anything, just to take an example, I don't know, for all I know it's still monk, but anything about acupuncture was ostracized, if that was my view about the medical community, then I really wouldn't have much basis for trusting what the medical community said about acupuncture, precisely because they had, can, if I know that you get kicked out of the med school, if you say anything, if you even sort of study the value of acupuncture, then I might say, well, I no longer trust the establishment's judgment on that because I know that there's been no, there's nobody else allowed within the community to question it. I can't figure it out myself, uh, but I'll only trust the institution so long as I'm confident there's not that much of a filter bubble. And uh, I don't think the modern university, for example, and other research establishments as to many contested issues, especially having to do with identity politics is trustworthy in that respect. So take the example you mentioned, Ted, with regard to uh, transgender athletes. There are all sorts of interesting empirical questions. I mean, normative issues may be something we can just talk about, but there are empirical questions out there. And I really have no reason to trust anything that the establishment says about such things because my sense, and it's informed by certain uh, things that I have myself observed, is that people who speak out about that uh, face very substantial social pressure and institutional and professional pressure not to do that. Uh, so the more I think that's so, the more it's not like I can therefore say, well, the opposite view is clearly correct. It's that I just don't see why this establishment should be trusted. To give you one other example, there, were, there was talk uh, with regard to, uh, some years ago, uh, uh, maybe it's gone further since then, with regard to doctors. And the doctors, when they're giving medical advice to patients, should give medical advice not just with regard to what's best for the patient, but what's best for the plant. Like you should switch to a vegetarian diet, not because a vegetarian diet may be better for you, maybe it is, but because that's what better, what's better for the planet. I think if doctors change to that perspective, that will lead me to trust doctors less because I'm afraid that the reason that they're telling me certain things isn't because of their objective evaluation of what matters to me. Because to me, selfish bastard that I am, I really care most about my health. But so they, uh, so I'm afraid that they're not really basing their judgment on uh, objective evaluation of that, but also on some ideology, which, you know, may have its pluses, but may not be something I'm willing totally to subscribe to. Uh, so as a result, I'm not going to trust their judgment anymore. So the more, so the problem is the more you think that there's this pathology, not none of the technical medical sense, uh, uh, pathology among uh, the learned professions, pathology among the experts, uh, because of filter bubbles within those communities, the more it becomes reasonable to distrust the experts. So then even if you don't have a filter bubble with regard to the facts, if you hear the facts, this is what the experts say, you will no longer trust them. And you know, fo a follow-up thought, when, when uh, you know, when Mark, Mark explained why he is not as concerned about the filter bu bubbles that are chosen, uh, I, I, I agree. I agree. I think, but it doesn't reduce the. It doesn't you know eliminate the fact that even if I can leave a filter bubble, the fact that others are in it, and uh, and that it may be corrupting. Uh, conversation or advice that doctors give, that, that those filter bubbles uh, may in fact affect not just the information I get, but, but other decisions about my life. That, that's the kind of um, societal, society level problem with filter bubbles, even when they're self-chosen and can be avoided by the individual. So, so David, I think is now bad, I just came back. Uh, so I agree with that, but, but let's remember the sort of flip side. Right. Um, you know, one of the things that happens on the Internet right now is that uh, uh, women in particular are systematically silenced by an outpouring of hate speech and vitriol against them when they speak in public. 
right? And the idea that a filter bubble could be, uh, we've been viewing a filter bubble as something that sort of insulates us from the reality that's out there in the world. Uh, but some of what we want to do is insulate ourselves from the sort of lunacy that's out there in the world so that a group of people, whether it's scientific experts or people who want to have a rational discussion that doesn't involve uh, calling people names, right, can continue to have that discussion. That's a filter bubble, right? but I'm not sure it's a bad filter bubble. And if it's one we choose, that strikes me as not necessarily a, a, a bad thing, right? I, I think we're better off with that world than a sorry, everything must be Reddit, whether you want it or not. So surely that's right. And let me just give you a confession about a filter bubble. In the old, when our blog was in the Washington Post, there was a feature to ignore certain commenters. And I did that, not to a lot, because it's actually important for me as the blogger to know what my commenters are thinking, but to maybe two who were fools. Uh, I love my commenters, but I have to confess two or three. <laughs> who, who are fools and who also, I know just made made uh, my reading of the comments a less pleasant and less helpful for me experience. And I'm not proud of that. If I were Spock, then I, then I wouldn't care about them and I'd just sort of ignore them. I wouldn't need this button, although maybe I'd have some mental button or maybe I'd be constantly looking. Maybe there's a little bit of diamond among all the coal. Uh, so that was a really nice feature and I totally appreciate the value of that. On the other hand, uh, and actually also, not even on the other hand, on the same hand, Mark mentioned, well, yes, of course, if somebody is just sort of an outright racist, you might say, what's the point of my listening to him? Because he obviously is so morally corrupt. The problem is we know how many ideas are labeled racist. So it's very easy for people, and I think very common for some people to say, yes, step A, we will ignore all racists or try to fire them or try to do whatever to them, but even just ignore. Step B, well, opposition to affirmative action is obviously racism, and opposition to illegal immigration is obviously racism, and anything uh, that any policy that has a disparate effect that's substantially and substantially enough based on race is obviously racism. I'm not trying to ascribe these views to anybody on this call, but there certainly are people who take that view, and it becomes very easy then to say, well, yes, we're going to have the an the anti-racism filter, but it filters out a lot which is, I think, another way of saying, again, that the problem is the impulses behind this are perfectly sensible human reactions that are, in many instances, quite rational, that we can indeed say, based on a person's foolish or evil views in a certain subject, our estimate of the value of their likely other views, we will update to be less, and therefore not worth our attention. Because if we're going to spread our attention, we ought to spread our attention to those people who we think will have something valuable to say, something not. The problem is, if you do that, if you do that enough, then you get enough kind of of an aggregate of error on your own part uh, that you end up only focusing on those things that you think are most likely to be useful to you. Uh, but really, uh, they're just, you think that because they're reinforcing your, your uh, existing views. That's the danger. So, so I'm wondering if, if we might shift to like sort of thoughts about, uh, about whether there are ways to reduce the pathologies without losing the the good good stuff, maybe that's where you were going to take us, Ted. Jane, uh, Jane I was going to say uh, either you're giving me my segue or you're reading the same comments as I am. Oh. I, I was just I, I was just going to jump in with two things actually. First, I was going to say, isn't it funny that we're uh, so the four of us who are in academic positions are all law professors, although with various trainings in our background. It's funny that we're talking about contestation over reality and facts and invoking science as a sometimes ideal and sometimes criticized model when, of course, we sit in a profession that balances right on the boundary between exploration of that which is true and kind of normative uh, commitments. And, and so we are like those doctors having to give advice based upon expert knowledge and unavoidably blending the two and in awkward. So Maybe we can do that for a minute or two, but I also want to follow Jane's advice here and say we have 12 minutes left and we have a bunch of great questions teed up about what on earth is feasible to do about these problems to the extent that we agree that they are real and serious. Uh, I'm, I'm going to distill about eight questions that have come through on this and say, one, several people have asked, is there anything analogous to a requirement for rebuttal that could be feasibly effectively de deployed 
on the internet, like given the vast diversity of information channels that people work through. And then two, one or two people have challenged us with exactly the question Jane posed a moment ago, which is, all right, given this combination of benefits and harms that we ascribe to the existence of different forms of filter bubbles, what would be the design criteria or primary characteristics of a social interaction system or platform that would pursue maximum social benefits, sort of get the benefits and mitigate the most severe harms? David, in, in reward for hand up, you get to go first. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, first off, my apologies. This old uh, iMac is starting to uh, enter its last days, apparently. So I got bumped again. Um, and the third time, it'll be because the aliens don't want me to tell them what I told, what tell you guys what I said last time, and that so, is so, so I speak channel, really fast before they I get channel here. for I channel for them. Uh, okay, so uh, in in any event, um, first off, um, the, the the what what Jean was talking about about villages. All of our ancestors lived in these villages, and ninety percent or more of them were the bad village dominated by the Lord at the top of the hill and his thugs and by the busybody gossips who um, the Stalinists recruited to be block commissars uh, and how, um, how the, the, the solidarity folks in, in, um, in Poland managed to turn that around uh, during the Jaruzelski era is a really very, very interesting thing. But a certain fraction of them were and nobody is going to pity your ancestors who lived in Canadian villages. <laughs> so, I do oh, not seek your pity oppressive. for my grandmother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, how oppressive. Um, the, the villages that are portrayed, again, in Hollywood films about small town, the Andy Hardy movies of Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, uh, it, which, which uh, everyone knew what everyone else was doing and tolerated it and helped each other. Uh, this, there's a great um, a TV, uh, uh, PBS thing called um, Jews and Americanism in Hollywood uh, and how the uh, heads of the studios pushed this, the beginnings of a tsunami of these propaganda messages about tolerance, diversity, suspicion of authority and, and expansive um, inclusion. Now, the questions that people raised about how we could do that with the internet is absolutely the right question. We should have a sixth arena, which has the accountability processes to, that enable markets, democracy, science, justice courts, and sports to be so productive using competition. And no, I'm not saying that we should have a ministry of truth that demands that people go to ritualized combat. The ritualized combat that I describe in my disputation arenas paper is more about shame. And I have found experimentally this last year of the election. I have a book of, of suggestions, 100 plus political suggestions, not one of which was used and this would have been a blowout. <laughs> but one of them was poisoned by Mitt Romney uh, four years ago, and that is wagers. And it turns out that in the, my experiments across the last year, I have used this method repeatedly, and all of the people I have opposed have run away screaming. Cash is more important to them than their yammering incantations. And when forced into a position where they would have to actually bet cash on their declarations of supposed fact, they always run. So if there's a matter of pride or shame or public credibility or cash, these are all methods that could be used to lure people who are in Nuremberg rallies to have their credibility decline simply because they uh, refused a call to ritual combat if the ritual combat were established enough so that it itself had credibility. This would take intervention by a billionaire. A billionaire I have estimated would, who, who put $20 million into this. This process could develop enough credibility so that when Nuremberg rallies, like different sides of gun control, were demanded 
you must show up next month to the preliminaries for a ritual combat over this, over fact, the things that you're asserting. I think it could work because there are five arenas in which it works. And I, without in, this- In the few minutes left, I want to invite the other three of you to weigh in on David's specific proposed solution or on the broad challenge that we've got from a bunch of our questioners. Okay, what do you do about this? Rebo, yeah. Truth so, test. Yeah, Mark. So yeah, so let me, uh, I mean, I, 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 I like the wager idea, but the, for the wager idea to work, there has to be either a neutral arbiter or uh, a correct answer that everyone will agree is correct. And when I made the controversial suggestion that sort of fact filter bubbles worry me more than value filter bubbles, the thing that worries me is that you're not gonna get out of a fact filter bubble with a wager. If the, if the answer is that regardless of the amount of evidence I prove to, uh, bring to prove my point to you, your response is, well, gravity is just a theory, so it obviously hasn't been proven, um, uh, or you know, whatever else. Right? Once, you've, once you've left the world of we start with a set of facts and we then sort of layer our values on top of that, and you've decided to create your own set of facts, uh, that's a really hard one to come back from. Well, let me, let me answer that briefly uh, and invite you back in by saying what's worked for me for the last year. And that is, it happens that the people I was talking to have a group that they both idolize and have disparaged. And that is retired senior military officers. And they are terrified of that fact-centered clade because A, they are supposed to officially revere them and B, they have been disparaging them because they know that they are fact center. And that is the thing that always makes them run away is that, that there is a clade that if we were to use a process of selecting, I select a retired senior military officer, you do, and they select a third. If you offer a process <laughs> like that, that offers somebody that, that besides respect, it's they run away. Yeah, well, it's because you've got a neutral arbiter that both sides can agree is trustworthy. I will note, by the way, you mentioned that sort of a bunch of us are law professors, right? Law is the form of ritual combat, right? That seems to me that is in some sense an antidote to the filter bubble, right? I, the one place where I have to confront, right? right. The arguments I disagree with is in court. Uh, because there is a person whose job it is to make me look stupid, uh, and there is a person who will get to decide which of us is right and which of us is wrong. That's a great form of ritual combat, and it's a great form of combat over sort of both facts and values. I don't think it always gets to the right result, but it's it's not bad. Well, you well, see that the difference. If I, could, if I could just chime in, just because I think the gun example is a very good one. As it happens, I used to for five years teach a seminar on gun policy. And I read a lot of stuff and I came to my own tentative conclusions. But I will tell you, just let give you one example. Um, one debate among gun uh, scholars is how many times guns are used defensively per year. And this is 90s data, so it's so the crime rate was higher, so maybe it's less now. One quite credible study says about 120,000 times per year in the US. Another credible study says two and a half million times per year. Um, so, you know, you could have retired military officers or whoever else try to figure it out, but I think part of the answer is we really don't know. For a lot of these things, one problem I think with a wager approach is a lot of it has to do with very complex systems. We could do a wager on how fast an object drops. That's a very simple system. But the question is what would happen in a state if we banned all handguns, well, unfortunately, we don't have double blinds where we split a state two ways and we don't tell either either half which half they're in, right? We can't do well, that. I, the, the, go ahead, Jane. 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 I think I, I would add to David's idea then by allowing an outcome to be we don't know, we don't know, and even that moves the ball a little bit. That is absolutely brilliant because. In the disputation arenas thing, what happens is in most cases, you don't come to a final conclusion, but in the course of ritual combat, the criticizing of this element or that element forces each side to 
to modify elements okay. in the direction of facts. Yeah. And, and once maybe, they've done that- Maybe to understand each other better, right? Exactly. To, to come out exactly. of the filter bubble. Exactly. Or to narrow and, so, and revise the terms on which they're fighting. Exactly. So, so even, even if they haven't settled anything, it's much the respect for a fact-based edifice increases. And when it comes to courts, courts of the five marinas arenas are the most meticulous and boringly, uh, boringly detailed and procedural because they can only af afford a low error rate, whereas uh, markets can afford the highest error rate. Uh, and so, so there's very little, much less regulation. We're, but we're almost out of time. Courts, Jane, Jane, you wanted to make an observation. The one last thing about courts is <laughs> okay, that when real it comes quick, to Jane. fact, when it comes to fact, we give that to the jury to decide, the least professional people. But, but I don't, so I, I still worry though that given the cynical acid that is thrown on authority with regularity today, I am not sure that someone who loses such a battle wouldn't just be able to demean the, the decider. So, um, but, but I still like the idea. So battle is one approach. The, the other approach I want to throw out there though is that I worry quite a bit with, with, with ideas like the rebuttal. Um, there's, there's some per, persuasive evidence, I think, that, that actually a lot of times, at least depending on context, people's beliefs tend to be also, you know, solidified when they're confronted. Um, especially in a, in a context where they're being told like, hey, you should consider this alternative point of view too. Uh, but one thing that, that I have found that is useful for persuasion, like when my own mind changes, it's usually from near criticism rather than far criticism, where, um, where if I see two people uh, who are actually share a lot of common uh, you know, uh, beliefs going in, but they disagree on something. There, I, I find that the uh, love, you know, the the, the persuasive value of, of what they say is is much is just much more likely to actually move my beliefs uh, too. Or or maybe the importance is that you know one of <laughs> whoever it is that persuades me to believe something different isn't coming from a wildly different place. And so I wonder if there's something there that's different from how Facebook and Twitter so far are dealing with misinformation. Okay. We're actually a minute over time and I know Mark has to jump out to another meeting. So I'm gonna call us up, even though there are so many fabulous things we keep discussing. And I have to abuse the chair by saying, let me throw out, look back at the science courts debates of the late 60s and early 1970s, because we are, we are echoing some of those. That I think that really merits a re-examination. It, it, it spawned the science and technology studies movement, which sort of critiqued, but I, I think there's more to look back on there. Um, okay, you folks are fabulous. It is such a pleasure to hang out and talk with you all. Thank you so much to every one of you, including to Mark who had to ring, uh, ring off for another commitment a moment early. Uh, thanks to the two sponsoring and convening organizations, AI Pulse at the UCLA School of Law, AIPulse.org and Tech Law at the University of Arizona. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, the recording of this event will be posted on the AI Pulse website and available for distribution through all our panelists within a couple of days. Stay tuned for announcements of other fun discussions in this space, which we hope to convene. Uh, thank you all. It's been a fabulous pleasure talking with you, and I wish you all a good day and weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>